We are speaking now with one of the top cybersecurity experts on the planet. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Before we start, there's a subscribe form and you can subscribe to our newsletter and you can also subscribe on YouTube. Please, please do that. So we're speaking with a guy who is like the guy, the guy. He wrote the book on cybersecurity. His name is Stuart McClure. He is the CEO of Silence. It's not his first security startup either. Stuart, how are you? And thank you so much for being here on CXO Talk. I'm great. I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Today, I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Silence. Uh, we've been around for six and a half years. And what we do is we prevent cyber attacks at the endpoint, at the servers, in the cloud, and anywhere that they go. Stuart, you've been doing this for a long time, and let's very briefly look back at uh, cybersecurity historically. What has changed? Well, there's been a few things that have changed. I mean, first of all, in the early days, uh, cyber attacks were very, very simple because they were um, really largely uh, kept to just a few folks around the world. And so, you know, you had to deal with maybe one virus every couple of months or one a year even. So it was quite easy for us humans that are on the defense side to take a look at something that came through, an attack that was successful, and figure out how it worked and then create a detection signature for it. And then get that signature out to everybody else that has yet to be victimized by this attack. And so that process was really, really quite simple. But today we have almost a half a million different attacks that come out every single day that are brand new to the world. So the sheer volume is one of the big changes that has occurred. The second is, I wouldn't say sophistication, but certainly the advancing and the sort of the collection of attacks that can be put together today can be quite complex. And so I think the complexity of the attacks are uh, definitely heightened and increased, let's say versus even 10 years ago. Um, so that's what we do. We, we make sure we maintain a focus on all those types of attacks, brand new, old, you name it, and we train our computers to learn from all of that. So, so you say that there are half a million attacks that come out every day. What are some of the more interesting attacks? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I got to tell you, you could write a, probably a fictional book every single day, you know, a Grisham novel just on cyber attacks, if you uh, subscribe to enough mailing lists and watch enough blogs and read enough technical papers that come out, because pretty much every day something comes out. Like today, I, you know, in preparation for the talk here, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll take a look at today's list of, of running announcements. And sure enough, there was a really a cool one. It's a banking Trojan on your mobile device, so on Android. So this is simple. If you have an Android device and you were unfortunate enough to install a particular series of applications, and they tend to be like games or tools that you might use that are um, fraudulently posed as legitimate, and you install it because you, you like a new calculator or a chess game or whatever it might be. In the background, it is actually sniffing and listening to all of your um, passcodes um, and all of your two-factor authentication for your banking platform. And so the, the one cool part of this, now that part's not new. That's been around forever and ever. Uh, we see that all the time. What was new about it is that to sense that it's a real phone and not an analyst doing a re reverse engineering on it, it senses the motion in your phone. And if it doesn't send it, sense any motion in your phone, then it knows it's in a sandbox and it will not run. Whereas if it's sensing motion, it knows it's actually in your pocket, it's a legitimate phone, and it needs to listen. So it's those kinds of techniques that even though that might not be brand new, you know, using different radios and, you know, sensors in your phone to do certain things, that particular one of sensing motion is uh, rather new. And how do we address that? What do we do about that? You know, if you think about it permutationally, there's probably eight different ways, but really core, there's, there's really two ways. You either uh, prevent it. Or you say, well, we can't ever prevent it, so let's just detect and respond faster. And we, I've always been a big, big believer that you can prevent it. So how do we prevent this kind of a thing? Well, we prevent that app from either A, getting into the app store legitimately, B, you actually downloading and installing it, or C, before it runs, somebody like a silence or 
a BlackBerry or something like that, looking at that actual app and knowing it's objectively bad and, and blocking it before it runs. That's the truest way prevention, preventative wise to do it. Now, if you don't believe prevention is possible, which many do, then you'd want to detect and respond. You'd want to be able to allow the application to run and watch its behavior, watch its activity, and then marry that to what we know is bad activity or bad behavior, and then call that out and potentially alert and block it down the road. But the, the downside of a detect and respond model is it's after the fact. So all of your keystrokes could be long since gone and your two-factor passcode is long since gone to the adversary and used by them to gain access to your bank account. And what about the adversary then uh, being aware that you're running these algorithms against the attack and thus changing the nature of the attack in, in various ways, obviously, to try to circumvent what you're doing? Yeah, so it, that's what we call adversarial AI or offensive AI, sometimes it's called. I just call it AI versus AI. We have yet to see an adversary of any sophistication um, leveraging AI in the wild today to defeat AI. So we know that that's coming. Um, we certainly have anticipated for many, many years. We actually have a team dedicated to adversarial AI research to build in a sort of a a preparation for that type of uh, technique going after us. And it will happen. Uh, we know that, but for now we haven't seen it and we are very, very ready for that uh, and have anticipated that for quite some time. The way that we do that is we actually try to break our own models, our own AI. And by trying to break our own AI, we're actually anticipating how the adversary would try to break us as well. And we do this in real time in the cloud in thousands of computers inside of Amazon AWS. And by doing that, we can actually predict and prevent new forms of AI adversarial attacks. Is adversarial AI uh, one of the key things that bring fear, that keep you up at night and that we should be worried about? In the next probably three to five years, I believe we will absolutely start to see this in real world being very successful to bypass other technologies, I'm hoping not ours, but possibly ours, to bypass these technologies and to be able to gain a foothold. But right now we are years and years ahead of the adversary because of this technique. I would say we're at least three years ahead. Now that window might shrink and when it does, then we will have a challenge. But again, spending more research, more time, more effort to make sure that we uh, understand all of the different adversarial techniques and then building that into our improving learning math models will ultimately keep us ahead of the bad guys. Why are you or how are you able to stay ahead of them? Is that simply a function of resources? And what I'm getting at is, so let's say that you have a, a, a country, a nation state, as they say, putting essentially unlimited resources behind their AI. At that point, do they start to win the war unless you're able to match that level of uh, resourcing on your side? Well, really it takes three things to build a, a proper AI or a bypass AI model. Uh, the first is the data itself, and that's what you might call sort of resources, at least the first implementation of is, is the data. So the examples of, of what would bypass us. And so that has to be created somehow. Now, the second thing are the security, dom the domain expertise. So the ability to know what is an attack or that's successful and what's not an attack that's successful and being able to label all of those elements properly. And then the last is the actual out, the learning algorithms and the platform that you use, the dynamic uh, learning system that you've created to be able to do this very, very quickly and rapidly. So you need all three elements. Now, a nation state could absolutely provide the first and the third without much struggle or problem. The second, which is the domain expertise problem, that is an age-old issue. If you, if you go into the entire security industry right today and you ask, well, what percentage of people, let's say adversaries in security, um, actually know how to create it, find a zero day, exploit it, and use it? It's just a simple example uh, of something that's quite complex. Um, you're probably talking about 0.1%. Of, of the, the hackers out there in the world that can do that kind of thing. So similarly, in the world of defense, the folks that can actually detect a zero day, prevent a zero day, and, uh, and move on um, uh, to clean it up 
are probably similar. I mean, we're in the single di- low single digits. So it's, it's a much more difficult problem to scale is the domain expertise. So while certainly a large country, China, Russia, what have you, we have a lot of resources at hand and a lot of smart people, you could start to catch up, but it becomes just a, a very difficult scale problem because humans are not easily scalable. So the issue, therefore, is not so much the algorithms, because you can build algorithms based on resources, but the uh, the domain expertise packaged in the form or or in the form of the the data. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the resources, the limitation around resources and just scaling resources is simply this domain expertise. Not everybody quite really understands the core foundational problems of cybersecurity and how to affect it and how to mitigate or prevent it. And that becomes a real challenge because it's a very complex, multidimensional field of both attack surface area and defense capabilities. So we've been talking about uh, using algorithms and data in the service of cybersecurity. Let's dive into this a little bit more. You talk about math a lot, and I'm not sure whether I heard you use the term mathematical cybersecurity, um, but it's a term that came to my mind certainly as you were as you've been talking. So, so. Tell us about the role of math in all of this and why is math so important? Well, to explain that, I have to start where the original idea for the company and the technique really came from. And it came from me doing a talk up in, well, I mean, many different places, but one of the ones that's iconic for me is up in upstate New York and Rochester at, at the RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, did a talk. And of course, it was one of the many ones that I would actually show hacking, you know, how do you break into computers and systems and networks and devices and everything. And at the end of the hour talk, um, opened it up for questions and sure enough, got one top row, uh, raised his hand. He says, uh, hey, Stu, this is all great and good and I'm scared to death now, but tell me, show me your computer system tray. I want to know what products you're running to prevent these kinds of attacks on your computer. And of course, I had just been acquired by McAfee in this particular scenario, and um, about a month actually before. And so I looked down in the front row of the audience and sure enough, it was the head of worldwide sales for McAfee. Now, if I had told the truth, I would lie to a thousand people. But if I, um, of course, I would lie to a thousand people, and I would probably, or I'm sorry, if I told the truth, obviously I wouldn't lie, I would probably get fired. If I didn't tell the truth, I lied, I would, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. So I decided in that moment real quickly to, to tell the truth. Um, say simply, uh, look, I don't need to show you my system tray. I haven't used any computer security software on this computer for probably 10 years before. And it's a largely because I ju- it's just not good enough to prevent against the kind of attacks that we, we waged against me. But I'm not 99.9% of the world. Uh, not all of the world gets uh, targeted like I do uh, after hacking exposed and my positions in cybersecurity. So I have to be really, really careful. So what do I do? I do very, very simple things to prevent the 99 plus percent of the attacks that, that get out there and would be waged against me. So first is you just don't blindly open any attachments whatsoever. Um, second, you don't click on any links. Um, you know, there's countless ones. Another one is passwords, making sure they're complex and long. But ultimately, I started to answer these questions over and over and over again. And I start to ask myself, gosh, I can explain how I prevent cyber attacks, very advanced ones myself, with very simple behavioral steps. Why can't we train a computer to do that as well? And that was really the idea behind it. And so I said, okay, let's start learning. My experience in education was programming, um, computer science applications. So I started to think, why couldn't we just build a very large decision tree matrix to learn what are the characteristics or features of bad and what are the characteristics and features of good in on a computer and then learn from that mathematically and build an algorithm for it, a really a math formula for determining the line between good and bad. And that was really the beginning of it. Now, my expertise um, in programming had long since expired by that time. So I brought in Ryan Perma, my co-founder of the company, and he brought in a whole team 
of data scientists to really help start to solve this problem. We didn't believe it, you know, it was even possible, but we wanted to try it. It felt like it should be doable. So that, that first original idea was proven um, successful about a year later when we launched uh, and released our very first math model on learned uh, behavior and samples uh, for the last 20 years. And we were able to, with six, seven data scientists at the time, to effectively uh, be two or three X more accurate in detecting uh, viruses and attacks than the largest AI, or I'm sorry, AV cybersecurity company out there at the time uh, between Symantec and McAfee. So just an incredible leap forward with very simple mathematics and algorithms uh, from a handful of data scientists is what really got us going and, and made us believe we can do this. You want to share uh, just a, a flavor or a taste of the, the mathematical techniques that you're using for people who, who have expertise, which is in math in this, which is not me, but, but there are people out there who certainly do. Sure. Yeah, sure. So um, we've gone through many evolutions of our algorithms and we use many different types of techniques. Um, but right now we've settled on two great um, sort of groups of techniques. The first is um, sort of traditional deep learning algorithms like neural networks. That's sort of our primary go-to usage. Uh, but we also use more uh, sort of anomaly-based algorithms like Gaussian and Bayesian, for example. It just depends on the use. And we've applied now AI and mathematics into, I think, over a dozen different features inside of the technology today to, to catch all kinds of different attacks. And so how these learning algorithms work, it's really, really simple. You take um, a large data set of data, uh, you take then the characteristics of all of that data, and then you feed the characteristics along with the labels into these learning algorithms, and it'll tell you what are the predictive features that are most um, sort of predictive of uh, a classification set. So like, it can tell us that this new product that is just released is going to be bad if you open it up just by looking at the outside, the box, if you will. Sort of like being able to guess what's in your presence at Christmas. Um, you, you know instantly because of the weight, because of shaking it, the sound, uh, because, you know, all kinds of characteristics, right, that you've learned over the years and knowing what your mom and dad usually would give you, et cetera, et cetera, what your needs are, you'd be able to decipher it. Well, that's the same sort of learning algorithm. Um, that we use. Um, one of the greatest examples I give is I usually tell people just just look outside or look out your window and look at people walking by on the street. Now I'm going to give you a challenge. Think of three qualities of each person walking by that would give you a high probability uh, detection that they are a, a man or a woman. Now of course this is a controversial topic but something that is I think quite quite interesting to talk about. You could look at them and say well Look, long hair tends to be predictive of women or females, but not necessarily. That's maybe only 90%. Um, uh, facial hair might be highly predictive of men. Not 100%, but maybe 90%. Um, Adam's apple, clothes, you name it. There's all kinds of qualities that you would probably come up with as you start to look through this. Now, just take those three or four features, these characteristics. Now plot that in a three-dimensional graph or a four-dimensional graph, if you have four qualities. And then now sick these learning algorithms into that graphing matrix in memory and start to learn from it. What will happen is, as you keep training each new sample that this is a woman, this is a man, this is a woman, this is a man, and you pull all these features, you'll start to learn that, yes, truly, these characteristics, hair length, um, Adam's apple, things that dress, are highly predictive of a man versus a woman. Now, doesn't mean it's 100%, but if you learn enough from enough people around the world, you can probably get to 99.99. And that's the same kind of concept. Now, instead of three or four features of a classification for us, we mapped over 2 million features. So that's how advanced the machine learning and the, and the feature extraction has become in our world. And you've been doing this for, you said, about uh, six years, seven years now? Almost seven years, yeah, it'll be in uh, June. And you're, I'm assuming that you're continuing, so you're mapping around two million features. Uh, how, how uh, to what extent are you introducing new features on an ongoing basis versus relying on the existing set? All the time. So what we do is when we get a new data set, let's say that we might've missed on, or we might not have confidently convicted on, 
we will then map those features and characteristics of that new data set and we might then promote those features in our prior feature map. So even though we might have seen those same features, we hadn't weighted them very high because they weren't highly predictive. However, in this new data set, those features are highly predictive and that'll elevate the weighting in our models and then it'll relearn based on the on that new data. And we do that every 24 or seven, all, all day, uh, all week. I see, and that's, that's of course the key to remaining up to date with new attacks that, that you see crossing your radar, so to speak. Exactly, you gotta stay on top of it all the time. And that's the important part of the adversarial AI too. Like I, I have a core team of folks that all they do is they try and break our own models like every single day. And whatever they find to break our models, well, we feed that back into the learning system and it gets better and better. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about some of the applications of this. And let's begin with Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things, critical infrastructure. What's, what's going on with that? Well, as you know, devices are overwhelming our world. Um, you know, the easy ones are simple things that are in your pocket, you know, the phones or the tablets that are out there. But of course, everything is getting connected, pretty much hyper-connected at this stage. Um, you can look at your car. Um, that is, uh, if you've bought a car in the last probably eight years, you probably have some connectivity in that car. It can be as simple as a tire pressure monitoring system that uses Bluetooth, or it can be a full Wi-Fi system. It could be a cellular connection. Um, you could have NFC templates. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can, that are inside of these everyday objects, things that we use that are now connected and certainly electronic. And when they're electronic, um, they now open themselves and expose themselves to potential cyber attack. Now, either something that's within proximity of the device or something that's far away and remote. And it just depends on the capabilities of the device. So that has now pushed into everywhere. And that can be into things like water treatment plants and nuclear power plants and, you know, oil and gas rigs. I mean, you name it, pretty much everything is connected in some form or fashion. Uh, the only question is to what degree is it connected? Is it connected just for logging and alerting or is it connected for two-way control? Uh, and either way, an adversary can take advantage of that and go after it. So it really is one of the areas when you ask me, like, you know, what keeps me up at night? I mean, besides my teenagers, it's probably uh, massive cyber attacks as a precursor to something far worse in the physical world, like precursor to war, um, but attacking the electric grid. And that's probably the number one. And keeping the electric grid down for weeks at a time would be a, an incredible precursor to something very, very bad. Um, and, you know, again, one of the questions I think is, you know, why, why should we listen to you, Stuart? I mean, you, honestly, I could tell you stories that would make you not want to listen to me or at least go find a, a shack up in the, the woods somewhere off the grid because this is very, very doable and very quite, quite trivial. Okay, so attacks, as you were just describing, on water plants, nuclear power plants, this, these are the things that worry you. Why do they worry you? Why, why is this one so serious? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, um, you know, when you, when you can shut down physical access to things like water and food, you know, you have a, a real big challenge there. But the other challenge is that a lot of people just presume that a lot of it's all protected um, and they're air gapped. And, you know, for the most part, they are air gapped and they follow good policy and procedures and regulations around that. But people make mistakes all the time um, and technology uh, vendors make mistakes all the time in terms of vulnerabilities in their products as well. And so um, all of these can be highly exploited if discovered by an adversary with, with a, you know, a motivation to do harm. Uh, we've seen that countless times. I mean, if you look at um, the Stuxnet virus, for example, the uh, virus that took over, and it was actually a, a, effectively a worm antivirus, but it took over uh, a nuclear power plant um, and then also took over a uranium enrichment plant um, out in Iran and was able to actually uh, destroy the centrifuges that were enriching uranium uh, for their plutonium uh, for, for the nuclear power plants. And so by, by doing that, they were actually able, the adversary was able to set back that program, that nuclear program, by probably at least a year or two, um, and could have done much worse. 
And th- that attack's largely attributed to is- Israel and to um, America. But it, sh- it just gives you a great example of what can be done um, with a very motivated um, adversary, somebody that really wants to be able to affect the physical world with cyber. What are the protection mechanisms that need to be in place in order to d- address those issues? Well, I think, you know, there's some simple ones, like um, it's been reported that the Stuxnet virus was originally uh, put on to the nuclear power plant through a contractor's USB stick. So um, if that is true, um, that's quite simple because the new virus um, could have been easily prevented had they had some sort of an AI approach to the technology or quite simply just don't allow USB sticks to be plugged into major systems controlling major infrastructure. Um, you know, either one of those would have prevented that quite simply. But then a- after that, after the plug-in of the USB and the, the virus starting to run, there are many stages in that kill chain that could easily have uh, been mitigated and stopped or prevented. Um, but unfortunately, they weren't, um, in large part because the, the adversary going after those systems knew um, all about what was put in there, the controls in place, the technologies in place, they knew what to get around and how to get around them quickly so that they could uh, perform the attack uh, quite readily. So you say the uh, the kill path is complex and is it similar to an airplane that when an airplane crashes, there's generally a series of failures that takes place? Is this a similar kind of thing? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And any, le- any different level or layer of functionality uh, or prevention could have failed for that attack or that crash to be successful. Uh, it's it's very, very rarely one little thing that allows it to happen. I mean, sometimes it is uh, for sure, but but not, not frequently. You mentioned that uh, companies don't necessarily keep up to date with things like, like patches and the security fixes that they need to apply. At the same time, uh, software vendors are focused not just on security, but they're also focused, primarily focused on the development of their products, uh, especially for for smaller companies. And so their attention is divided. You have lack of education. You have, um, you know, a whole a whole range of issues that can lead up to this. And it happens. I mean, look at this, like, look at... Um, the cyber attacks that take place on the credit reporting agencies, for example. And so with all of that, what the hell are we going to do? <laughs> no, it feels, you know, honestly, if you sat down and actually thought about it, it feels quite exasperating. I mean, that's why I wanted to put, you know, when I wrote the Hacking Exposed book back in 1999 and every year since that I published that thing, I've tried to keep it as complete as humanly possible because I think education is our weakest link. I think the vast majority of folks that are responsible for security of their organization don't know how the adversary actually works and how they actually get in to their systems and networks. And if they did, if they did know how, if they knew the surface area of attack, they knew the techniques, they knew the paths in, they could infinitely better prevent cyber attacks. And if they believed in prevention. So what can we do? I think you, the, the only hope uh, and I know it's self-serving, but it is just absolutely the truth, is a machine learning approach to prevention. It really is the only way. Collect as much data about all these attacks as humanly possible, build learning uh, algorithms to help learn from all the characteristics of it, and then now apply that to brand new attacks and see if it catches it. And that's that's probably the only hope that I have in the industry. I mean, outside of just turning off the you know the, the computer, or the device, right? Hitting the power button used to be my only answer to that question was, well, just hit the power button because that's about the only thing you can do. And even then, by the way, Michael, even by hitting the power button to, in today's technology doesn't uh, prevent an attack. So for example, there are uh, countless um, examples in the last just year or two, but it used to be for the last 10 years of technology on your computer that actually, even if it's powered off, an adversary can hack it and then gain access and turn on your device and hack it inside of your own computer. Uh, It's called TPM capabilities inside of the Intel chipsets, but there's also um, other technologies that do this. 
So it's not just about power anymore. We really do have to get to a brand new approach to this problem. This old approach of signature-based detection and respond is absolutely 100% broken. It just does not work and it will not prevent the unknown unknowns, the attacks that everybody gets hit with all the time. And so if you adopt that approach, this learned approach, we have a shot, but you've got to get that technology and that capability out to everybody. And that's the real challenge. Do you have data on the efficacy of signature-based approaches versus mathematical approaches uh, in dealing with, with new and evolving threats? Yeah, the data is very, very clear and has been for quite some time that traditional signature-based approach are anywhere from 30 to 50% effective on brand new unknown unknown attacks. Whereas artificial intelligence machine learning approaches are in the 99.9% effective rate. And that has been well tested independently um, for the better part of five, six years now. We're, we're going to run out of time soon, unfortunately. So let's move on to the future of attacks. And I think you alluded to that, but, but tell us about the future of cybersecurity over the next, not 10 to 20 years, but next four or five years. Well, I think two things. One, it'll you know, get more and more complex in terms of the bypasses and looking for such using AI and adversarial AI for sure. But also, I think the surface area is expanding quite rapidly with all of the connected devices. And there are going to be ways that attackers are going to gain access into these devices that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, certainly, the manufacturers haven't thought of yet. And so, I, I really think it goes all back, always back to this education part. I mean, from the defenders and the victims, there's an education element, but also from a supplier and a, a provider perspective, uh, technology companies build all of these. I mean, this webcam that I'm looking at right now, I mean, there are countless vulnerabilities in this thing. Um, in this monitor, uh, there's in my TV at home, right? So all of these things have countless vulnerabilities and the manufacturers themselves either have to get educated and, and start to produce more secure devices or quite honestly, the government has to go in and regulate it. And I, and I use the R word there, but I and I hate to use it, but I don't know how else we're going to get manufacturers to really take it seriously and prevent vulnerabilities from being introduced into the products. Because a large 99% of all the vulnerabilities that are present in any of these devices are completely preventable. Uh, we've known about them for decades, how the adversary gets into devices. So if we know about it, well, software developers and program managers should be able to make sure that it's put into these and, and these attacks are prevented inside these devices. So I think it's going it, to, it really, the future is both. I mean, we, we've got to get manufacturers being much more secure and aware about security we got to get the defenders a lot more uh, aware and educated about how the attack attackers and adversaries get in and, and how easy it is to prevent. And um, we've got to think about it in a preventative light because detect and respond just does not work. What advice do you have for government regulators who are looking at this and they want to do something? Because I think everybody's pretty much well-intentioned, right? I mean, the, the good guys and the people working for the software vendors, they have good intentions. But how does the government deal with something that is so profoundly technical, what do they do? Well, I think first is to demystify how simple the solution really is. Um, this is not a, you don't need PhD, a team of PhD, you know, programmers to come and explain it to you. Uh, it really is quite simple. I've been on the Hill multiple times to help explain. And it, there are very, very simple things that can be done in the development life cycle that can prevent 90 Five, 99% of all these attacks, for sure. It, it doesn't take classes. It doesn't take you know, regulation and, and a stick to be whipped upon us. It can be as simple as open the book and learn. And that's the unfortunate part. So my recommendation to regulators is, number one, use the carrot first. Simply um, adopt a, um, a strong software development lifecycle approach with security in mind. De uh, develop that for industry, with industry, and then provide rewards, incentives for adopting those and proving independently that you've adopted those approaches and, and those, those frameworks. Now, if after a period of time, there is no adoption, no interest in adoption, and you, those incentives are not really appealing, and that could be tax incentives or, you know, all kinds of things, then the uh, threat of the stick and regulation might be the only last step that we can do. 
Um, I, I don't know how else to do it. I mean, you look at how the EU adopted GDPR. You know, eventually they just said, guys, we're going to, you guys aren't getting this fixed. <laughs> so we're going to set this policy and guidelines. You have to follow it. And if you don't, there'll be uh, penalties and punishment. And unfortunately, I think that's what we might have to get to. So GDPR may be a model for how governments can relate to this type of complex technology. I mean, there's a lot of criticisms of GDPR. Uh, there's a lot, and, and they're absolutely valid. Uh, many of them are absolutely valid. But I think it is a, um, a great example of how a government could step in and uh, provide at least guidelines and um, recommendations um, and mandates eventually. Stuart, in our last 10 minutes or so, five to 10 minutes, what can cor what should people inside corporations do? Technologists, uh, uh, CISOs, CIOs, what should, what should they be doing? Well, first, I mean, I, I hate to beat the dead horse here, but education, right? Just learn as much how the bad guys, I mean, you're trying to prevent bad guys from getting in. So how, how can you possibly do that if you don't know how they actually get in? That's first. Now, yes, you, you know, whatever company you're working in today, you're going to be probably regulated in some form or fashion, or at least a compliance mandate forced upon you. So you need to be aware of these compliance mandates, regulations, you need to follow them, of course. Uh, but they, all of them, every single one of these regulations or mandates or compliance or requirements of you are there because the attacker was successful in uh, breaching your defenses. So now you have to go back and say, well, wait, so what if we could actually prevent the bad guy from actually bypassing our defenses and getting in? And we could do it objectively without signatures or without a, a sort of an old traditional detect and respond approach. Could, would we even need regulation? I mean, if you can prevent 99.99999%, there's no need for regulation because the likelihood of an attack occurring is so infinitely small, you're not going to build a whole system of regulation and compliance. So my recommendation, education number one, know where the bad guys uh, go. Where they come from, who really cares? I mean, they could be in a, in a basement in Idaho or they can be you know, in a building in Shanghai. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, but how do they do it? That's, that's key, education number one. Number two, you know, for all of you that have to communicate this to your superiors, to the board, um, cybersecurity and the risks they're in, uh, make sure you try to take as quantitative of approach as you possibly can. So what I mean by that is being able to measure your state of security and your risk in a quantitative, repeatable, independently verifiable way, and then make that your standard by which you measure yourself over and over and over again to show either improvement or, uh, you know, not improvement going down. So quantitative approach, education as much as possible, and then being able to speak to the right audience. If you're speaking to the board, you know, don't speak to them about bits and bytes. Obviously, speak to them about risk, risk accept acceptance, risk mitigation, quantitative measure, holding people accountable, sense of urgency, things of that nature will, will save your careers, quite frankly. Um, and also really taking a preventative approach. I can't tell you how many companies, I mean, you mentioned a couple in, in the credit business, uh, but there's countless in retail and you name it, even banking, that that have lost their leaders, the CISOs, the CIOs, even the CEOs because of data breaches, and in large part because they didn't believe prevention is possible. And they, they didn't put a, a concerted uh, financial effort into, hey, how do we actually prevent all of these attacks from occurring? Um, rather than just detect and respond, because even five seconds, I mean, there are some people out there that say, well, I mean we can detect attacks within five seconds. Well, that's great. That's better than five years, which is what it was 10 years ago. But five seconds is a lifetime to an attacker. I mean, you can do an insane amount of damage in five seconds, and you can set up all kinds of backdoors and all kinds of things that a detect and respond approach would never be able to, to catch. So prevention is key. Start with prevention, then do, do detect and respond and clean up. Stuart, as we finish up, you mentioned that you have uh, daughters, you have, uh, you have a family. What do you tell them regarding security? In other words, what's the advice for just the rest of us to not be a victim? I think the biggest one is just don't trust anybody. Um, 
That's so depressing. It sounds it sounds hyper- hyperbolic a little bit, but but it's a great place to start because you know you're going to break that rule, okay? But if you yeah, it is a little depressing. But so like I tell my son, he's 19, first year in college, you know, and I've been telling him ever since he could probably listen. And like, look, even if you get an email from me or a text from me, it says Stuart McClure or it says Dad or whatever it is. If you're not expecting it, if it's not something that I would have sent, or if you look at the source and it's not really from any email that you're aware of from me, don't trust it. So again, start with don't trust anybody. So zero trust, Uh, but then go to, okay, now only trust that which you are expecting, that which you know is traditionally um, within the realm of possibility. And that looks legitimate. Um, Because remember too, I could be hacked. So how would, how would my son know? If my computer got hacked, the attacker then sends something to my um, son, uh, unless he could really peer into like, wow, I would, I'd never, I would never get an email from my dad like this. This is very weird. And pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, did you send this email to me? Unless he did that, he would probably get hacked thinking that, well, I, I trust my dad and what he sent me. So unfortunately, trust is probably the biggest one a recommendation that I can provide out there. Just simply don't trust anybody. Uh, validate, trust, but verify. You know, verify that this individual is who they say they are and that they're actually giving you uh, what you want uh, for sure. And then second is make passwords long. They don't have to be complex, just long. Um, and uh, that they're unique to each system. That's that the, the, the hardest part of that equation is the uniqueness Um, that what, what that means is that if you have a Gmail password, you cannot ever reuse that password on your Yahoo or on your windows computer. Okay. You have to have a brand new long password for each and every single system. Now you can employ some technologies to help you manage those passwords for sure, but ultimately you don't need anything. You just need to make it long and unique. If you can remember a pattern that's complex enough that allows you to do that. But those two things, trust no one and, you know, long and unique passwords, you're going to kill 99.9% of the attacks out there. You know, my, my mother is about 90 years old. And the other day she called me up and I've been kind of working with her on some of these things slowly over the years. And the other day she called me up and she said, somebody sent me this thing and it's got a link and it says, I need to get Adobe PDF. Should I click that? And I... (laughs) That's exactly it. And you know, the funniest story is, so I used to get these calls literally every week from my parents, uh, my aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and you name it. I mean, we, every week. And so it was a major motivator for me to actually build this company because I thought to myself, I I just can't scale. I'm going to have nieces and nephews and grandnieces and nephews. I can't scale. And by employing now this technology into all their computers, I'd literally get no phone calls anymore. Now, that's, I guess, the downside of it. They only used to call me for help. Now they don't call me anymore. It's probably a a sign of some problem I need to deal with. But but ultimately, this, this kind of technology can actually silence all of those attacks. And that's the, the, the reason behind the name of the company and the, te- and the techniques we use. Okay, fantastic. Well, we have been speaking with Stuart McClure, who is the CEO of Silence, which uses machine learning techniques to uh, develop preventive tape as preventive measures, essentially, for cybersecurity attacks. He is author of the book, Hacking Exposed, which is now up to version seven, and it's an incredible Bible. He's one of the most knowledgeable people in the world on this topic. Stuart, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and talk with us today. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, go to cxotalk.com, subscribe to the newsletter, subscribe on YouTube. We'll be back next week, and there's lots of videos at cxotalk.com. Thanks so much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.